we have the Lansley Linkages project, which Andy Rebel has been running, but Andy's going to be sharing with the college, is correct? Yes. So they're going to be a little dance together like we had before. So I'll allow Andy to explain that. <coughs> So afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so this is really the estuarine component of the of the work, um, and the focus of this session is, is modelling, as we've heard. And um, I'm very much not a modeller. Um, fortunately for you, Nicole is, and so she's going to present um, the meat of the meat of the talk. I'm just going to give you a very quick introduction to where we worked and uh, just a little bit about the environment. <coughs> um, to start with, obviously, um, sorry, <laughs> you'll hear me. Um, <laughs> Just to give you an outline of the project team, um, it's myself and, and uh, Miles Vanas were responsible for looking at uh, nutrients and carbon flow in the system. Richard Silverstein, who um, started life at CSRO and ended up at UWA through this project, um, looked after the, the um, terrestrial component and export scenarios. Nicole and Matt uh, and the team at UWA did, did all the modeling work. Um, <clears throat> so where we were working, so here's Broome, We've seen a lot of uh, Signal Bay, and we were working in Walcott Inlet, which is just up here. So you see, quite challenging. We had to tra transit around the, the whole archipelago, um, which was a full day, day and a half transit time e each way, depending on, on how the tides were going. Um, usual sort of um, work that we did would be, we, we didn't get to work on the ship. We had to work on a, on a little boat, um, which made life interesting. We were on, uh, we mounted bottom eight ECPs, current, current meters, pressure sensors, did a whole bathymetric survey to get, to get better uh, data for the models, a uh, whole heap of water measurements, uh, usual sort of stuff with particular organic carbon, nutrients, chlorophyll, some markers that we use, and also some sediment grabs, um, again, for similar sort of measurements. Um, those of you who saw Renee's talk yesterday, she's working pretty hard. She did all the filtering work, which was, which was really nice. Um, <clears throat> the sort of system that we, we tried to, to do some measurements, we basically set up a standard, standard grid and some transects through the system. Um, you probably can't really see the detail in this, it's, it's in the report, but basically we got a whole heap of water samples and, and grab samples. Um, the system isn't very uniform. There's lots of places, there's some little red dots here where you actually, there's no sediment, you can't get a, um, a grab sample, for example. Um, the whole system is really characterized by uh, muddy sides and, and not much in the middle at all, which is quite, actually quite uh, characteristic of, of Kimberley um, estuarine systems. Um, we managed to do two sample surveys, a dry season and a wet season, um, fair amount of cost and effort involved in that. So unfortunately we only have two dots on uh, Matt's little example there, <laughs> despite that amount of work. There we go. Um, just a little bit about what the environment looks like. Um, <laughs> Basically, um, we all see nice little pretty pictures of the, of the Kimberley through the last day, day and a half. Um, it's pretty easy to see when you get in the influence of the outflow from, from somewhere like Walcott Inlet. Nice, pretty sharp line in between turbidity and, and the outer water. Um, you've seen this photo already, but lots of whirlpools and overfalls. It's a very high, highly dynamic um, situation to be in, which makes it very exciting when you're in a very small boat. Next one, we go. Once you're actually in the inlet, um, again, highly turbid water, uh, quite st steep sided, lots of vegetation in, in, in some places, um, really steep mud banks, um, as you'd expect when you've got 10 to 12 meter tides operating, um, generally fringed by, by mangroves. There is life, um, even though you may not see it. So, just here, we've got a little mud skipper. Um, <clears throat> probably grazing on, on benthic microalgae along, along here. Um, you can see there's abundant little holes. Thank you. So just a quick um, finish off my, my five minutes, a little bit about why the rivers are important in this, in this sort of scenario. This is some data that uh, Miles put together. It's a combination of WAMSI and the names data taken on a cruise from Darwin to Broome during the wet season. And it compares the nutrients coming uh, down, the ri down the rivers in blue and, and in the adjacent coastal waters in yellow there. And what you can see is in the rivers are actually inputting quite a lot of material, both in, in a range of nutrients. Dissolved organic nitrogen here is something that we don't know very much about and what sort of role that plays. Um, and obviously dissolved organic carbon here and, and silicate. So the, the rivers are putting a lot of material into this, into this systems. 
And this is uh, my sort of work, um, which I'm not really going to go into, but this is, what, this is uh, total fatty acid data for the dry and wet seasons in the, uh, in the sediment. It's really just to show that the wet season, again, is bringing in quite a lot of carbon. Um, these are very carbon lean systems compared to, say, uh, temperate ones. Um, but there's obviously material being brought in, and this is actually a proxy for labile organic carbon. So this is carbon that can actually be used by things rather than being leaves and twigs and those sorts of things. So, so the rivers are bringing in quite a lot of material that we need to know a lot more about. And with that, I'm going to stop. Okay, so um, I'm going to now talk about the models that were developed as part of this project. Uh, so the first one to talk about is the hydrology model, which um, Greg spoke a little bit about in the um, uh, previous talk. So obviously the hydrology is important uh, from a modelling perspective to understand what the inflow of both the water and when we move on to the biogeochemistry, the nutrients and the suspended sediment loads coming in. Um, sorry, I'm just... Uh, we'll also, um, it's also important uh, for looking at the response to climate change variability. So that's something that was extended with this um, modelling approach. Now, the difficulty um, with the hydrological modelling is that there is not very much um, uh, data collected in these regions. Uh, the, there's only one stream that's gauged that flows into Walcott Inlet. Uh, and we needed to um, have the inflow for the three different catchments that end up in, um, in Collier Bay. Uh, but this was reconstructed from the data that was available. So you can see the time series over 50 years of the inflow in Walcott Inlet. And then uh, in the bottom, uh, you have the um, uh, example of what happened in the year 2013-14, uh, which we're focused on with our uh, observations. So you can see that this year was um, a reasonably wet year. So then the next step, um, there's even less data to base this on, um, that's to actually calculate the nutrient and total suspended sediment loads into the estuaries. And the issue here is that, um, well, there's really a handful of data samples over many years of, of nutrients uh, going into um, Walcott. So we heavily relied on the Fitzroy catchment data in order to come up with these numbers here. And these were, these were related to the stream so flow so that we had a daily input of nutrients and um, suspended solids. Uh, to input into the model. So the model that I'm talking about is this estuary bay biogeochemical model. And so the, the purpose of this model, um, well, first of all, it sits in the same range as the physical model that Greg just spoke about and basically has the same physics that's underlying it. And then it has the biogeochemistry on top of that. So the reason um, for this modelling approach is really to be able to look at the function of different areas um, within the Bay Estuary system uh, and to evaluate how important the terrestrial nutrient supply is um, to the coastal ocean and how that changes um, as, as the inflow conditions change. So this is a conceptual model um, which uh, Matt will talk about a little bit more. But basically, we're concerned in this uh, project with this region here, including the uh, estuaries and bays. And uh, the idea is that in these uh, estuarine regions, uh, there is a very high turbidity and the productivity is, is largely um, determined by this um, low light environment. Um, but the nutrients are also important in this uh, area in the bays where it's um, kind of semi-enclosed by the, the, the reefs and islands, um, the, there's less of an issue with the turbidity. Uh, so the physics is controlling what happens in terms of the advection and mixing in the biogeochemical model, but then all of the processes of the biogeochemistry are un, uh, underpinning it. So as I said, similar area to the physical model, And uh, this is an example of a time series. Um, whoops, there we go. I'm 
anyway, it's along a transect that goes from uh, Walcott Inlet, so that's on your uh, right hand side of each of these figures, out into the open ocean and for a bunch of different parameters. And this is just kind of to show you uh, what things look like over time. So you can see that uh, this is for March, so after the major rainfall, but still in the wet season, we have fresh water coming in. This is supposed to disappear. Let's see if I can make it disappear and the movie continues. Yep, that's good. Um, we also have the input of some amount of uh, suspended solids from the inflow and also um, largely the dissolved, uh, the nitrogen is in the form of the dissolved organic nitrogen. And you can see a response in terms of the, the biomass of the picoplankton here. So, but what we ultimately want to be looking at is things like budgets um, to determine how important those terrestrial nutrients actually are to the system as a whole. So this is um, one, ex one way we can look at things. Um, again, we're looking at a transect which goes from Walcott Inlet to offshore. And Walcott Inlet mouth is zero on this scale. And this is going towards where the inflow comes from. And then this part here is the embayment out to kind of Montgomery Reef. And this is in uh, more of the open ocean uh, extending across the shelf there. So a little bit complicated, but basically um, in time, you can see that there's very little uh, freshwater input at the beginning of this record, which is starting in October. And then we have this uh, freshwater inflow that occurs in the, in the February, March period. And we look at the response of the amount of nutrients um, or how far the nutrients extend uh, into the system from that freshwater inflow with these lines here. So these dashed lines up the top show you where 50% of the nutrients extended to, so the distance that they extended to. So you can see that only after this major peak in the inflow do we get 50% um, of those terrestrial nutrients actually exiting the mouth of Walcott Inlet into the Greater Bay. Um, but these lines here are showing the 1% um, load of nutrient, terrestrial nutrients. So you can see that as the, fresh, as the uh, fresh water continues over the wet season, that they eventually at a few hundred kilometers away, you still have 1% of the nutrient um, available being uh, from the terrestrial source. But how important is this to the actual primary productivity? So these plots here are showing um, over three different time periods um, heading into the end of wet season, um, what the relative importance of terrestrial versus um, recycled nutrient is to the um, primary, product, primary production. So again, along the same transect where zero is the mouth of, of Walcott Inlet, this is going into Walcott and this is offshore. So you can see in the wet season, we have a, uh, the terrestrial component is in, shown in blue here as a very small component in terms of um, uh, impact on the primary productivity compared to the yellow, which is the recycled. Uh, whereas if we go to the end of the wet season, then we've got about 60% uh, within Walcott is um, uh, new or terrestrially derived nitrogen versus um, the rest of the com uh, component being recycled. But you can see that it all very much is within Walcott Inlet and as you go outside the uh, mouth of the estuary that um, the dependence on the terrestrial is, uh, in terms of primary production, is very low. Uh, the next uh, little bit here is just to look at the impacts of climate change. And the basic story here is that there is, um, in 50 years time, there is very, uh, predicted very little change in the inflow in Walcott Inlet under different um, extents of, the, of uh, different climate change models. And really then the impact in terms of the input of uh, the terrestrial nutrients, assuming that the catchment is unchanged, which we have to really have as a basis for, for this model, uh, is quite minimal. So this is showing um, how the, the um, nutrient enters and extends its zone out from Walcott Inlet with time as a function of inflow. And this is from our initial modeling um, for the 
2013-2014 season. Uh, but if we say that um, climate change is in, going to increase our flow slightly, then we're going to only have a slight uh, increase in the distance of that influence of the terrestrial nutrient. So say over 10 days at about 1,000 um, metres cubed per second, it's only going to change the extent by about five kilometres in terms of the terrestrial input. So because the loads are relatively small and relatively unimportant in the system, um, the impact of climate change, at least this view, is quite small. Okay, so um, just to sum up, I have um, a few suggestions for uh, the kind of ongoing impact of um, the models in here. So I think they can be used going forward to uh, better understand how different subregions within the Bay Estuary um, uh, and how they function, and this can inform both management and, and choices around zoning. Uh, we can uh, look at changes in catchment use and feed that into the hy hydrological model to look at how we might expect input to change. Uh, also, obviously we've focused on one catchment here, but there is a lot of scope to extend this work to other catchments within the Kimberley region, which either function in a similar way or uh, in a very different way. And then finally, to um, actually more directly look at the impacts of climate change rather than um, this um, kind of more indirect way that we've approached it through through this project. Okay, thank you.